The Unshackled Waves, episode 134. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. It was a big week of international news, a lot of it relating to United States President Donald Trump. His hardline stance on North Korea paid off with the rogue nation coming to the negotiating table. And Trump also announced new tariffs on steel and aluminium imports, which has uh, caused much debate. South Africa has now made the confiscation of white farms official government policy. And we also celebrated a new holy day with it being International Women's Day on March 8th. Today we are joined by two Unshackled Editors, Deputy Editor and Host of Front and Centre Podcast Emilio Garcia and Chief Correspondent Steel Archer to discuss the week's events. This is the Unshackled Waves Review Show. Steel and Emilio, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. Glad to be on the show. Now, of course, this is a highly uh, experimental uh, format uh, of the show. Now, we did have the uh, three-way episode with Nathaniel England and Magnus O'Mellon just before, but this is the first time we've done a review show uh, three-way. So uh, let's hope that it it all runs smoothly and uh, we we can all manage to to have our say, even though the, the line is a bit more congested. I think it'll be fine. Well, let's pray for the best and uh, let's get on with it. So uh, Donald Trump uh, over the past uh, six months has, has taken a hard line uh, with North Korea. I mean, he's, he's called uh, Kim Jong-un a rocket man, said he's got a bigger uh, nuclear button and all these lefties have been freaking out. He's going to cause uh, World War Three. But we heard this week through uh, South Korea that uh, North Korea now want to enter talks with uh, both South Korea and the uh, United States about uh, denuclearization. And actually, there's going to be a face-to-face meeting with Kim Jong-un uh, and uh, Donald Trump. And so it would appear that uh, Trump's tough talk and, uh, f- to, to use the expression, 4D chess uh, game has uh, paid off. I mean, I think anybody who is going to say at this point that Trump hasn't done something correctly is suffering from some classic Trump derangement syndrome. I mean, as you guys know, I'm no fan of the guy. I did not want him to win. I hated the the prospect of the other person winning, but still really didn't want him to win. But when it comes to what has been uh, done so far with North Korea, uh, it's hard to say that he did anything wrong. He, no one has had this much progress so far. And listen, right now, if you watch, uh, you know, the lefty shows, if you watch Anderson Cooper, if you watch... Uh, uh, you know, Don Lemon, uh, basically they've shifted away from saying whether this is good or bad and shifting everything to, well, we don't know if we trust Trump to handle this level of negotiation, which just goes to show that they're trying to, to push a narrative of, yeah, maybe, like we're not going to say this is amazing, which it is, because, you know, we just really don't like Trump. I, I look at it from a geopolitical perspective. There's two, there's two big things that are going on. One, um, Trump has used the, the the big card that he can, which is the aggressive card, and the aggressive card works well as long as all of your all, all of your points are in favour, and that's what's happened with the, him on the UN Security Council. They've you know ratcheted up the sanctions. They've put a lot of pressure on the North Korean regime to break. the The challenge now is that Kim Jong Un has now, with this with this new uh, meeting that he's trying to set up with Trump. Um, that you know this bilateral uh, meeting. The problem now that they're going to face is is the fact that if America readjusts its posture like it has like it has before, where it starts to withdraw from the region, then you end up with the same problems all over again. If you if if Trump continues continues with pushing with you know with military assets uh with uh, the erection of anti ballistic missile systems and so on um that etc will uh he he lose out in the long run um with with key regional players with allies with xi jinping with russia and others in the future that's uh the core game that's going on it's a very clever uh, it's a very clever 
play by Kim. And I'm really interested to see going forward how Trump deals with this. Well, ultimately, it seems Kim is interested in just keeping his regime alive. I think that's been the, the truth as long as the, the regime of the Kims has been alive. And so I never really thought, and this is something people were saying, you know, that he's brought us to the brink of nuclear annihilation. Kim, you know, he's erratic, he's a bad person, he's a piece of shit, but he's not stupid. And he knows that any time that he would use one of his ballistic mils missiles would mean the end of his regime, ultimately, and himself. So it was clear that he was just negotiating to the most extreme that he could in order to... Uh, to kind of get what he wanted, which is ultimately to be able to maintain his regime, to be able to be the leader of North Korea, to have all the wonderful um, extravagant uh, luxuries that he has, and essentially not have to kind of, you know, bend over to what he would say the uh, globalist pigs want him to do. And I think Tr uh, Trump has he's called North Korea's bluff uh, pretty well. I mean, the, uh, the, the policy of previous administrations has been where North Korea is, you know, testing nuclear missiles. Oh, you know, we'll be, you know, nice to you, you know, send you aid and that. And, uh, of course, a lot of these missile tests have uh, be been complete failures. And so Trump, it, well, it's a pretty high risk move, but, but just basically said, yeah, you, 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 you want to threat, uh, threaten us. Uh, you know, here, here's, uh, here, here's my insult towards you, you know, go ahead, uh, do your worst and uh, basically, you know, expose, you know, North Korea's threats as hollow. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I think, I think you're right. I think uh, where, when you look at the latest, uh, latest uh, it's type, uh, type, type one do uh, rocket tests and stuff, they've, they haven't been uh, very successful. I mean, in terms of hitting Japan, um, you may have something to go on in terms of hitting South Korea. They may have something to go on, um, but this is—I mean, this is the this is the dilemma for those regional actors in terms of hitting anything uh, as far as uh, the U.S. mainland. At North Korea itself doesn't put that as a high priority. They're thinking about hitting Guam, maybe Hawaii if they can, all these other things. So it's not a huge, you know, it's not a huge strategic dilemma for the United States in that in that way because it's putting a lot of pressure on the regional allies. Um, remember we're going remember North Korea is constrained by its geography. It's its its main strategic dilemma is its north and southern borders. Uh, it's protected pretty well on its flanks and we've seen that in the Korean wars uh, previously. But I'm thinking of this as uh, going back to the 1992-1993 where they had the quote unquote uh, they almost had the agreed framework. Um, um, then Kim Il Sung died in that time, and uh, the agreed framework didn't happen. And then again, we had it in I think '98 when we had the uh, the first sort of satellite launches, and uh, we had a lot more pressure put on uh, North Korea. And within two years, we had uh, a sort of détente. Uh, sort of, we had the you know South Korean president visiting North Korea and, and stuff in that time as well. So what I think, what I think is this is a uh, you know. Uh, this is round three for the breakout period. This is round three that they're trying to play the same trick, and I don't think Trump will put, a, put, put fall for that again. Now, again, going forward, he has two options. One, keep the pressure up on an international stage on North Korea, but now North Korea is asking to bow out because it's saying, hey, we want our resources back, we want those trade sanctions lifted, and if Trump gives into that, then they'll have resources to maybe continue their missile program into the future, which is kind of what previous presidents have done, and or he can keep up the pressure, and then that will put strain on uh, the relationship with China and Russia. And China is trying to get out of the region anyway. That's what the whole Silk Road project is about. So it's going to be a very interesting historical s summit if it goes ahead. The date and time is yet to be determined. But it's something we really got to watch out from, and it's very good place for both sides. Absolutely. And I mean, ultimately, we really don't know what's going to come of it. We don't even know what, uh, what, what, what the progress will be, if it'll happen, all these things. But I mean, it must be said that it's definitely a step forward from, uh, I think, the Obama era policy of strategic patience, which is basically uh, jack shit. I mean, it means nothing. Strategic patience is, is, is nothing. It's doing nothing. So, I mean, we don't really know what's going to happen, but ultimately, it's definitely a step in the right direction. It's almost... Uh, uh 
what Trump's done. It's uh, Reagan-esque in a way, because of course, uh, uh, with the US and Soviet Union in the 70s, there's been the policy of uh, uh, detente, uh, which had basically allowed the, the Soviet Union to, you know, just go along business as usual. And Re uh, Reagan uh, in the 80s initiated a new arms race. And of course, the Soviet Union, because it's economy was so decadent it just couldn't keep up and eventually uh it collapsed and so um oh it would certainly be uh if history is to repeat itself it would certainly be good if uh you know tr uh, trump's uh basically you know enticing north, north korea to you know divert all these you know resources to this uh failed program would have the the same effect there that, that's a really interesting point, Tim, because like the Reagan Star Wars project is the one you're talking about. And the Star Wars project was a, well, a multi a multi billion dollar project that, as you said, the USSR just couldn't keep up with it. We don't have anything like that with North Korea. They can't even afford to feed their own people. Nobody's worried about, you know, them funneling extra extra uh, billions of or even, you know, billions into into their program. They're giving everything they can. Um, I think. I think what what they are doing is what their geography defines, and it's exploiting their regional neighbors. But you know, we've had this uh, we've had this sort of detente with the Olympics, and you know that was all really nice. It was really uh, it was really kind of peaceful, and the world calmed down from the quote unquote fire and fury days. Um, so we'll see we'll see. I mean, it's it's going to be an interesting time, and I think Trump's going to deserve a lot of credit, which the mainstream media is not going to give him. Um, but a lot of the chief strategists out there, geopolitical strategists and the real world watchers definitely uh, can see the, the, the strategic value behind this sort of aggressive Trump push. Donald Trump announced this week that he was putting a 25% tariff on imports of steel and a 10% 10, 10 uh, on imports of aluminium. Now, uh, this has caused a mass freak out in the international community and the World Trade Organization, uh, but it was uh, an election policy uh, of Trump's. He said, you know, I've... Uh, the the word he always uses, you know, we have we've done these terrible deals. We 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 need to you know renegotiate them. Uh, and obviously, you know, America first, uh, blue blue collar jobs. What do we make of uh, this tariff announcement? I'm happy we moved on from me having to say only good things about Trump to now moving on to only saying bad things about Trump, because this was clearly one of the stupidest things he's done since he became president. Um, first of all, he says that he's imposing this because you know steel and aluminium industries in the U.S. are dying and all these employees have been fired and it's all, you know, it's the fault of China and it's bullshit. The, al the aluminum and steel uh, industries in the U.S. are doing just fine. Two thirds of all the steel that is used in the U.S. Is, pr is produced in the U.S. We saw tremendous growth of both of those industries in the last year. And now he's turning around saying, no, we need to, we need to set, uh, we need to impose tariffs on this. And everyone, mostly on the right, I will say, said that this is terrible. This goes. Uh, this is antithetical to all the things that fiscal conservatives want to do. You don't want to be passing on. Uh, you don't want to be passing on costs to the consumers. You're basically giving a ticket to industries in the U.S. that are less efficient than industries elsewhere. And so basically, all you're saying is, you know, I, I basically want to play to my base. So I'm going to make people pay more money. And it's also going to do exactly nothing for our economy. All it's going to do is it's going to start a trade war. Also, Donald Trump said that they're easy to win. I think history will tell us that that's not true. But you see, there's Trump derangement syndrome on both sides. The lefties, they think that everything he does is terrible. The people on the right, who would regularly oppose this strongly, who if Obama did this would say that he's some kind of, you know, imbecile, some kind of protectionist imbecile, the second that Donald Trump does it, oh, you know, oh, it just makes sense. No, this is really a terrible move on, on behalf of Trump. Well, Trump, Trump is, Trump's argument with the tariffs is, is mm -hmm. two or three. I'm not... I'm not exactly sure which is his priority but one he thinks that you know china's dump china's production of steel is way too high which by the way mao zedong would be very proud of because that was a whole great leap forward so well done china for producing lots of steel you finally <laughs> done it after 50 years but um it, 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 the quality of the chinese steel he thinks is terrible okay he thinks he's d dumping terrible quality steel on the united states and that they want better quality steel so he's saying all right let's let's principally put a tariff on china now the uh, the rest of the steel exporting world, Australia, Mexico, apparently, 
and uh, Canada, which is Australia, which is America's biggest importer uh, of steel, is uh, they all cried out immediately for exemptions. Um, the other big player in this uh, that really had a, a hissy fit, so to speak, about uh, tariffs was the, the European Union as a bloc. Um, they produce a lot of steel, especially in places like Germany. And then, you know, um, but Trump is saying, hey, if, uh, if, you want, if you don't want tariffs on, uh, if you don't want uh, us to impose tariffs on steel exports from the European Union, Mercedes-Benz, uh, BMW, all of these uh, big car manufacturers, you know, let us, uh, we're going to impose some, uh, some, some um, tariffs on them like you do on our farm equipment, because obviously the European Union has one of the biggest uh, subsidized farming industries in the world. And, you know, they can't uh, interact there on the, the farming exchange. So Donald Trump's trying to stimulate, what he's trying to do is he's trying to stimulate the farming export, the farming, farming machinery growth export model out of the United States that's being hindered by the European Union. So he's using China as a tool, as a mechanism to start this trade war so that he can get those farming equipment over into the European Union. It's quite a, it's quite a genius plan. And, and, and I'd be watching for Mercedes-Benz and I'd be watching for BMW and car manufacturers in Europe um, uh, to see if he ratchets up on this plan. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ingenious plan. I think uh, I, come from the, I come from a sort of a liberal uh, arena of uh, global growth. I don't like tariffs at all. But I think, you know, under the, co uh, under the context of America first, if you're going to use them as a, as a, a jimmy and a jive, because the other thing in here is NAFTA, and we'll probably have a talk about that. But if you're going to use it as a jimmy and a jive, uh, let's play. Yeah, that's Absolutely. an interesting uh, point about the European Union. I mean, they're one of the most uh, protectionist uh, blocks in the in the world, and uh, it's also aimed at uh, Mexico and Canada uh, as a way for Trump to be able to renegotiate uh, NAFTA, which uh, you know tr uh, Trump uh, ha has accused of uh, the United States of uh, losing uh, heaps of jobs over the past uh, twenty five years. Even though they're in f they're at full employment, uh, no. Listen, there's such the, uh, tariffs in their own right are not necessarily bad. Sometimes you have targeted surgical tariffs that you know if they if there are countries that are that are affecting the way in which your businesses do their business, and if it's really really creating a massive job loss, then you can impose tariffs to make to make your um, your uh, industries more competitive with them themselves. But this whole thing about about uh, targeting uh, aluminum uh, across the board, not even not even targeting different countries for it, uh, just targeting everyone except Canada and Mexico, um, is first of all it's it's not correctly implemented. The reason it's twenty five percent, by the way, is because it was going to be twenty four percent, and he said he wanted a nice round, round number, which is, does not look to me like a like a person who is very you know skilled in economics. And another thing to take into consideration is that the United States is not really a producer anymore. It's more of a consumer. And Donald Trump doesn't seem to have the economic prowess to understand that a deficit doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong. Uh, I, a lot of people have explained this. Like, it, it basically, if I go to the store and I buy myself a bag of chips, then I have a deficit with the store. But that doesn't mean I didn't get anything from it. I gave them money and they gave me this thing. And so, it, it, honestly, I think that, that what's going to happen is that, honestly, all this momentum, all these great things, all these great things that are happening to the economy, they're not going to start, they're not, they're going to start to level out. First of all, we have rising wages, which is going to lead to more inflation, which is going to mean that at some point we're going to need to hire, to, to put more interest rates on things. There's not going to be so much cheap money, which companies are going to stop, stop uh, investing as much. And now you have, you have uh, more, more expensive products. So what exactly... Donald Trump is trying to achieve here, I really don't understand. You thought maybe a lot of people were saying before he actually signed them in that, you know, he was just trying to take the most extreme position and then basically bring everyone to the center and get, you know, a, a few concessions, which would have been smart. But he already signed them. And, you know, the only one that he didn't, the only countries that are exempt from this are Canada and Mexico, one of which was supposed to pay for a big old wall and he was going to be very tough on them. And now, you know, here's this great concession to them. So, no, I mean, uh, I, I don't think this is defensible. And, you know, the European Union can have their own shitty uh, laws, but to say that, that, that taxing their aluminum is somehow going to bring them to the negotiating table when it comes to far less important industries to the United States, I think is pretty, it's just, there's just no evidence for it. Well, I think, I, I agree. I think, I think uh, 
you know, I, I've always pretty much been a, a dollar, a dollar, uh, a dollar bear. I think uh, I think that the U.S. dollar uh, is, pr is pretty much going down, uh, but down relative to what? The Chinese yuan, I guess. Uh, th that's the only thing I could think of. The European, the, the euro, the euro isn't much of a competitor to the U.S. dollar. So. In saying that, I think that I think you're right. I think I think interest rates will be on their way up again, and uh, I think in that there'll probably be a strengthening in the dollar. I think the dollar might the might might be heading up even more. So in that in that respect, from a currency respect, I don't actually see the idea of tariffs. But I don't think this is a currency. Uh, I think this is the campaign promise of Trump digs coal. You know, I think this is a a play to uh, the red states as well. Uh, you know. Um, uh, and you know, there, there's been if you if you if you're following the housing market, uh, there's been a lot of money shifting from blue states to red states in that context as well. And I think this is just that on an international level. And Australia is oh, they've negotiated an exemption uh, from this uh, new tariff because there was uh, you know a big panic because uh, e even though uh, there was a big dispute uh, uh, between the the two major parties in Australia about the Trans Pacific Partnership, the uh, the Turnbull government decided it would proceed without the United States, while uh, Labor, influenced uh, by the left of their party, uh, thought it was. Um, uh, not worth it, but there, there still is this uh, free trade consensus between the major parties, and so uh, it, was, it was this uh, the past week the Turnbull government was frantically uh, trying to get this exemption, which uh, w which they did. But now people are asking, well, what did you promise, you know, Trump in return? Because remember, you know, Trump is the the out of the deal guy. I mean, you start with you know an extreme position such as these tariffs and not uh, exempting anybody, and then uh, you know you have obviously negotiate these exemptions and see if there's anything else you can get from these other countries. Well, just on that, um, so I think I think that I think that Australians are kind of worried because we do have the uh, geopolitical split between the United States and China. Who do we go with? Economically, China, USA security. It's kind of a obvious split here in, uh, in Australia uh, uh, in a negotiation. And Trump has asked for more security concessions from Australia. He's talking about Darwin. He's talking about uh, up in the, the Cocoa Islands. He's talking about more interaction with the South China Sea, more engagement with the South China Sea from Australia. And, um, and, and, and people are wondering, as you said, well, if he's going to give us concessions, like the uh, Australian government has uh, so ardently said that he will, on these uh, Chinese, on these steel and, uh, and aluminum, aluminium tariffs, well, then what? Uh, then what is it? Is it another security agreement with the United States? Are we digging down even further uh, for, to, to to attain these concessions? Uh, concessions. So I, I think it's good. I think it's a good question. The government seems adamant that's not the truth, but I. I would be very skeptical uh, about that, considering how free trade uh, uh, the Liberal Party and Labor Party are. They are addicted to free trade. They love free trade. They they they're very big on the economy. So, I mean, because because free trade is, is, is naturally the way in which in, in in which things work. I mean, it just makes sense. This whole thing about you know subsidizing people for being inefficient, I think, is the worst possible thing you can do. Another point to make about the, the uh, steel industry in the U.S. is that a lot of people say, like, look at the job loss. A lot of that job loss isn't because we're buying steel from other places. It's because of automation. So unless you want to, you know, impose uh, tariffs on robots, then, you know, you're not going to get jobs back. And so the Australian government, you know, they can do whatever they want if it's in their basic interest to continue to export to the U.S. And, you know, it's, it's, it's so much in their interest that they can have a few concessions. That's fine, but but the general issue is that there shouldn't be tariffs at all. There really shouldn't be. And you know, you can say, you know, well, yeah, but like all these different countries are now going to come to the negotiating table and basically give the U.S. some things that will then make them, uh, then make them, you know, loosen up, and you know, the U.S. will win. But not necessarily, and especially in the short term, it's extremely harmful. Uh, you know, ju ju the the fact of the matter is that all all of these different products have steel in them, and. You know, every time that it, that that steel goes through another uh, another stage stage of production, money will be added, cost will be added to each one of those steps, and it's not only economically uh, a big issue. It's 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 an issue of um, 
of being competitive and an issue of being productive. And what's going to happen is that all these consumers and all these smaller companies are going to get affected. And Donald Trump is, you know, just sitting back and saying, uh, out of the deal while, you know, these guys are, while these people have to pay more money and while people lose business. So, uh, I mean, a lot of people say that this is kind of a genius move. Well, I think on, the, it's, on that, on, on that point, on that point, the, 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 Initial cons- uh, the initial tariffs that have been proposed at 25% and 10% would only be, for example, another $100 per car, or it would be another $0.03 cents per can of Coke. So it's not a massive amount of money. It doesn't, you, you, don't, you don't feel it if you're buying a car in the United States. If you're buying a $50,000, $60,000 car, even a $30,000 car, an extra $100 doesn't make a difference here or there. An extra $0.03 cents on a, a $3 can, a $2 can of Coke doesn't make a, uh, doesn't make a difference. But I think, I think in general it's a principle. But as, uh, as we we're saying about the European Union, the European Union's allowed all of these protectionist policies. A lot of countries have protectionist policies. And then any time America stands up for itself in, in this way, it's a bad thing. I mean, it's, it's a currency argument more than is an economic argument. I think you can't fight the currency. Um, that's why manufacturing disappears in the first place. So um, I think maybe it boils down to a political, a political discussion more than anything. In South Africa, the confiscation of uh, white farms without uh, compensation is now official government policy. Now, the the Parliament of South Africa, they, they passed a resolution. It still has to go through the uh, co- uh, constitutional process for it to be enacted, but it's clear uh, now under uh, new president Cyril uh, Ramirosis uh, what, what direction the, the nation is now uh, going in. And, of course, uh, this official policy is complemented with the uh, uh, attacks on uh, white farmers, which uh, last year uh, led to over 70 dead and over 400 uh, farm attacks. And uh, this has actually been encouraged by... the. Rami Oskis is from the ruling African National Congress, but there's an even more uh, radical uh, party in the, in the parliament, the Economic Freedom Fighters, where their leader, Julius uh, Malima, uh, he's been convicted of uh, anti-white uh, hate speech and has actually you know, suggested we should have a genocide of white people. And so it's really a, a dangerous place for, for white people in South Africa and proof that, you know, racism against whites exists and it has deadly consequences. I think anyone right now who would try to play this up to anything other than a racist, horrible policy implemented by a hostile government is just completely out of their minds. And to see so many mainstream media outlets not covering this because it's such a racially touchy issue, I think is akin to a criminal act. They have the power to get the voice out there, and they're ignoring it. I would anyone who's watching this, please go on CNN and and type in like in the search box, type in South Africa farmers white, and the first story that comes up is one: the new South African president promises new dawn, and nothing about the confiscation of land. And I think that's despicable. Now I understand that there's this there's this uh, there's this concept on the left that says essentially if you're a white person, then you cannot be discriminated against because you have privilege. And that's just, you know, first of all, it's stupid. I mean, I don't know where that even came from. But right now we're seeing it. This is a targeted racist um, policy, which is going to destroy the livelihood of people based on the color of their skin. If that were any other race, people would be up in arms about it. But somehow because it's white people who are farmers, you know, these are not not privileged people necessarily. They're just, you know, farmers who are trying to make a living. And the government's going to swoop in and take away their farmland, their ability to make a living because they're white. Uh, I don't know how people are not more outraged about this. The the farms that are in question, some of them are older than the United States itself. Uh, some of these are three hundred years old or plus. Um, so these aren't uh, these aren't new new farms. They're not they're not they're not farms that have just appeared from nowhere and been appropriated from nowhere. These are very old uh, generational intergenerational farms. Now. In saying that, I, th- I think that the media blackout is the worst uh, worst part of this whole story. I, I would say that uh, this is the uh, this is the crux of the issue. Why is no one in the Western world? Why is no, none of the media uh, discussing this issue? Why, like the the thing is, they're not even celebrating the issue. There's just an actual uh, blackout. 
um, which is quite which is quite disgraceful. Now, if we had the re policy reversed in the United States, let's say we had confiscation without expropriation of land of uh, African Americans or Latinos or Hispanics in the United States, or you know, if or if, or if the uh, Chinese picked on some Mongolian uh, or Tibetan minority or something like that, the world would be an uproar, absolutely an uproar. But where is the where is the global community on this issue? Where are they? Why aren't they speaking up? What what is the agenda? I, I don't I don't understand. I don't know what's going on. I think it's uh, I think it's awful. I think it's a, a horrible position um, the South Africans are in. Petition after petition after petition after the petition has been launched online by various online uh, including the Unshackled. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, we have one. We have one right here at the Unshackled. And, uh, you know, and there's millions and millions of people who are pouring uh, money and time and effort into, you know, getting this out there. And yet there's still a media blackout. It's it's disgraceful. Uh, and, you know, we'll continue to report on this uh, this issue, uh, you know, here on the Unshackled. Absolutely. Um, these, com these, these communists who are in third line in the in the, uh, the you know, in the in the in the South African parliament, uh, even if they do get their way and they have their genocide, they don't, they're not going to like the, uh, the effects from that. Absolutely. And I mean, you also have, uh, I mean, you also have uh, the issue of, um, of just seeing how far the media bias goes. We always knew, we always knew that there was a bias. We always knew that people would kind of try to appeal to their base, but we never thought that it cut this deep. And um, I mean, obviously, I mean, we, uh, probably Australia should be should be accepting uh, white refugees with the same, you know, with the same caution of, you know, refugees from other places. Uh, a lot of white uh, South Africans have some of the similar um, traits that, uh, you know, in terms of their culture that many people in the West would be would be skeptical of. So that's also an important thing to take care of. But I mean, to see basically people saying we're not going to pay attention to this, you know, we can, we can pay attention to the other atrocities that are going on in the world because they seem appropriate, you know, racially at least or to our base. But, you know, as soon as it comes to the subject of, uh, of people, you know, of white people being uh, attacked based on race, then then we're going to be quiet about it. It's, Kind of awful. Yeah, the coverage of this, uh, of what's happening to the white farmers in South Africa, it was only the alternative media that was getting the message out there. The Unshackled has published uh, numerous articles on what, what's going on with the farm attacks in South Africa. But uh, this year, Lauren Southern, uh, who's now an independent commentator, she uh, went to uh, South Africa to film uh, a series of videos and also a full-length documentary. Katie Hopkins of the, the Rebel Media, who's based in the UK, she also went to uh, South Africa. But since this policy was enacted, it's it is now starting to get some mainstream media attention. Uh, News Corp uh, Australia have sent uh, some of their team over uh, in uh, South Africa to you know interview the the victims uh, of farm attacks. And I've seen uh, you know a few oh, not senior politicians, but a few uh, a, a few uh, elected uh, Australian politicians also decry what's happening uh, in, in South Africa. So you know it's it's it, it's becoming. Uh, it's alarming more people like, whoa, this is, uh, you know, this is basically, you know, dispossession and genocide, what's what's happening. And uh, the Unshackled's petition, we started at uh, middle of last year, it's got over uh, nearly uh, 16,000 uh, si signatures now. And we hope that there's a, a federal politician who's, you know, willing enough to, you know, t uh, take it on and, say, you know, say, you know, wh white lives matter. And, and you know, there, there's probably, you know, and this is how sick and depraved the, the left are. They, they probably think, oh, well, you know, the whites, they, you know, press the blacks under, you know, uh, under apartheid for, what is it, 50 years, they're, uh, they're getting what, uh, what's coming. And it's like, oh, what? So, you know, apartheid hasn't been policy for like 25 years. Most of the, um, you know, whites alive probably wouldn't even supported it. Like, you know, do two wrongs, you know, make a right? Does that, you know, entitle you to go on, you know, some, you know, bloody revenge? This is the nation of tolerance and, and liberalism and, and racial equality. This is a nation that, that embraces the liberal ideas which America and, and Europe and other places are going down. Um, even non-white non world uh, members are going down. Uh, and it's, 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 
it's going to be an interesting uh, finale. I mean, where is the UN on this? Where is the U UN Human Rights Convention? I haven't heard anything from these guys. I haven't heard anything from uh, the mainstream uh, sort of uh, national media, so the ABC News here in Australia or uh, PBS in America. I haven't seen anything like that. Where are these guys? Why is it that when it becomes commercially viable, uh, you know, like Laura, like the rebel media didn't report on this, but Laura Southern did as, as an independent. Why is it once it becomes commercially viable to, you know, make money from the deaths of these innocent people, uh, then it becomes okay to go and talk about them and, you know, relate to their stories. I don't understand. This is, this is a, this is a, this, this is a human rights violation. This is unbelievable. I mean, you will see the UN talking about gender conscious solutions to global warming. You see them discussing this type of bullshit, but you don't see them discussing the fact that there is a, an inherent genocide or a, a racially targeted um, militia going after people's uh, people's land. Uh, how how is this not the story? And you know, I mean, just imagine what Nelson Mandela would have would have would have thought of his country going this direction. It's it's absolutely despicable, and uh, again, the the whole concept of well, the whites oppressed the blacks back then. First of all, I mean, it's really important to understand. Yes, there was a lot of racism. There there is a very uncomfortable history in in South Africa, of course. But first of all, it wasn't the whites. It was a lot of white people. They they implemented things that benefited white people and not black people. This is true. But it wasn't all of the whites. I'm sure not every white person in South Africa is a direct descendant of the politicians and the the, the people who who came into to South Africa, uh, you know, at the very beginning and implemented all these things. Obviously not. So I'm not responsible for anything that my ancestors have ever done. Nor is anybody ever. This is just one of those things. And I mean, if you want to look at ancestry, at ancestry and, and people being guilty for their for their ancestors' problems, uh, I released an, an article about uh, Yasmin when she, you know, said that uh, that people, you know, white people should feel guiltier about uh, their um, their ancestors going around pillaging, raping, and um, and enslaving uh, when Islamic slave trade was larger in uh, was larger than European slave trade and lasted for longer too. So it's one of these things of saying like, you know, well, the past. Um, the past of people who are not alive basically lets us uh, be racist in a non-racist way to these people, uh, which just carries no no merit, and it, it's just intellectually not sound. And we're also seeing history uh, repeat itself because uh, Zimbabwe in the early 2000s under Robert Mugabe did exactly the, sa the same thing, confiscating white farmers' land. And you know, we we all remember the you know massive uh, inflation uh, in Zimbabwe during that time. You know, the the billion dollar bill agricultural output collapsed, and that's uh, you know seen Mugabe removed uh, now. And the the new government, although they're not giving uh, white farmers their land back, has you know introduced a you know a compensation scheme, uh, you know, is actually, you know, white people receiving an apology for uh, wrongs done to them. You don't see uh, that often. But, you know, th th there's a historical example of what happens to a nation that does something like this. And South Africa is right next door and has said, yep, we want the exact same thing. Well, it might not have yeah, the that's why. consequences that, uh, that Zimbabwe had. Like, if they, if, they, if they take away the land and they're efficient with it, uh, you know, they, they, they might not have the same issues, but it's not really a problem. It's, that's not really the, the issue here. The issue is that uh, even if they can take that land and be, you know, even, you know, if, even they can, they can improve the production and, you know, have five times output and it could be good for the economy, who knows? The fact of the matter is that it's an illegal racist thing that they're doing. We wouldn't accept this for any other group. This is, the, this is a reality. And to say that, oh, well, you know, they're white, so they're cool because, you know, they have white privilege. So, you know, feed your kids with that white privilege. It's bullshit. And it's, it's, it's awful. And um, so, again, for me, it's not that much of an economic issue. It's just the, the morality behind it that's so atrocious. Absolutely. The, the morality is, is, is absolutely key to this. This is an immoral act. And, and, and I, think, I think that if, if they do go through this, this, they'll have to learn the, uh, the Zimbabwe experience all over again. I don't think they've learned. I think they think they can do it better. I think that they probably think they can work the land and understand the land. Um, the truth of the fact is, is that the whites have been working the land. They own about 80% of the agricultural land in that, in that uh, somewhere between 60 and 80% of the agricultural land. And they've been working that land systematically for 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 a long time, and, and I don't think that they'll have the capacity to uh, continue on. So if they do do if they do continue this uh, this uh, this posturing, I think that they will uh, severely suffer for it. 
um, and 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 a big human tragedy will envelop. We're continuing this final segment without uh, Steele. He's had to uh, go off to work, so it's uh, just me and uh, Emilio now. Let's do it alone. Our final topic is International Women's Day, which has basically become uh, a new holy day in the West, equivalent to, I'd say, uh, Easter or uh, Chris- Christmas. Uh, uh, but it's basically become a day of man-hating, uh, victimology and uh, virtue signalling. And probably what a lot of people uh, don't know is that it's a day that has uh, communist roots. It was first uh, was a, a national celebration in the, the Soviet Union. And uh, uh, among the events of International Women's Day in Australia is that Australian Broadcasting Corporation sacked all its male presenters for a day and had an all-female uh, lineup. And of course, we got the uh, uh, usual complaints that you know uh, men are you know not doing enough, and you know there's not enough women in you know politics, business, uh, science. Uh, the, uh, the usual complaints that you know our society is such a patriarchy. It's uh, it's hilarious, you know. Nothing, nothing really screams equality like firing men for a day and just having women. That's just you know just the picture of, of equality for you. Um, no, it, you know it is a shame. You know, obviously, obviously, I've, I've never I've never had really an issue with people having you know with um, people just you know creating a day to celebrate themselves. Uh, I think that that's okay. You know, I think that you know having you know uh, your gay pride, your Latino pride, your Black History Month, all these things are fine. But yeah, they, it just you know right now they have turned into this you know chasm of virtue signaling and, and hating you know anything that isn't you know uh, in the intersection and it's and it's just really really awful. Um, right now you know this whole thing I saw this girl walking around yesterday around Sydney with this sign and you know it wasn't yesterday but still she was walking around with a sign that said I'm a woman not a womb and I was like. Are you, are you? How stupid are you? No one thinks you're a womb. Who the fuck said you're a womb? You're a, everyone knows you're a woman. You have a torso, a head, and two arms. No one, no one ever assumed that you were just a womb. And it's just this, this, you know, taking everything to the extreme. You know, assuming that men are looking at women as these little baby-making factories that have to stay at home, make a sandwiches, and uh, and have babies for us, which no one has, except you know, the only people that think men think that way are are, are the organizers of all these events. And you know, kind of like the, the loudest voices in the crowd, and it's it's just kind of disappointing to see something that should be you know a celebration of women, which is perfectly fine, turn into like such a such an awful like hateful event. And, and there's hardly any commemoration of how far we've come in the West when it comes to you know women's rights. I mean. You know, going back a uh, hundred years ago, women first got the the vote. I mean, in the seventies, they got you know workplace you know rights. They, uh, you know, they they didn't have to you know resign when when they when they got married. And you know, today you know women can choose whatever career they want. They're uh, you know any type of you know uh, sexual or physical violence against them is you know not just uh, you know considered. Uh, you know, a, gr- a, gr- a gross act, but it's also, you know, a criminal offence as well. I mean, women have it, you know, pretty good in the West compared to uh, other parts of the world, but it's just become, as we'll talk about, that, you know, women are still, you know, help- helpless and, you know, they need, well, especially uh, their, their new husband, it seems, these feminists, is big government. They want, you know, big government to put through, you know, quotas, you know, give them money for their various uh, f- uh, f- feminist causes and that it's, it's basically that uh, their argument now is that you know women they they can't do it themselves and so they need help. Yeah, yeah, which you know is is a long way from you know uh, the woman you know kind of holding her arm and saying like we can do this to we can do this but only if big government lets us. Um, I mean, yeah, that, that's so true. I mean, women obviously in uh, in the West are are not oppressed. You know, you can say that there are some issues, and obviously there are some issues, but to say you know this exaggeration that somehow women are oppressed by the patriarchal society in the US, in Canada, in Australia, it's it's simply not true. I come from Mexico, and for example, in the eyes of the law, everyone's the same, and there are a lot more systemic issues uh, towards women, for women. Um, one example being a friend of mine who uh, worked at a lab, she was the first in her class, and she was working there with a couple of other guys from her class, and uh, she was the only one that was like asked to go get coffee and things like that, and everyone else was doing like cool laboratory things. Like that's an actual thing that you could point out and saying like that's that's actual discrimination, right? Here, women are like, oh, you know, a man, uh, you know, held a door open for me. 
that's me being oppressed. It's awful. And one more thing that's really awful is, for example, there's this woman in the U.S. called Linda Sarsour. I'm sure you've all heard of her. But she's, you know, an advocate of Sharia law. She's a Muslim advocate. Uh, you know, if you want to be a Muslim advocate, I don't really care. But if you want to be an advocate for Sharia law, that's where I would draw the line. And she's a huge part of the Women's March and the Women's Day celebrations. And I just don't understand how a woman who thinks it's Sharia law, where women in front of the law have 50% of the rights, can't leave the country or their home without a male guardian's permission. That male guardian can be a young child, as long as he's a man. Uh, that, you know, there's all these uh, all these violations, you know, having them um, put a, you know, uh, buried up to the to the to to their head and then having rocks thrown at them, uh, you know, having their genitals mutilated, having all these things. And somehow she, she's saying, like, oh, you know, one of the biggest issues that we have in the West is that we're oppressed. We should go to Sharia. You know, they're doing it right. I think that's really disgusting. Oh, that's too hard to, you know, campaign for women's rights in, you know, Middle Eastern and African countries. It's much easier to complain in the West about, you know, uh, mansplaining and man uh, spreading. And, and it's also much easier to demonstrate that, you know, you're uh, a feminist. For, uh, and probably the worst example was uh, uh, Malcolm Turnbull, ladies, uh, International Women's Day press conference. He was, an, uh, he was announcing his... Uh, uh, women in science uh, policy. He, di uh, he didn't have he didn't have just one you know pink ribbon to show how much he cared about women. He had two, one on one on each uh, side. So he doubly cared about uh, women, uh, yeah, more than uh, the people who were standing behind him with uh, uh, the the pink ribbon. So you know it, it's mu it's much easier to to do that sort of thing, and every everyone prays you to say, oh, you're a good person. Exactly. Listen, that, that I don't even have much of a problem with, you know, trying to get women in science. That's all, that's all good and fine, obviously, wearing the two, kind of a virtue signaling move, but there's nothing inherently wrong with it. What, what, I, what I really have a problem with when it comes to these dates is the inherent man-hating and kind of like, you know, oh, you know, today is the day where we're legally okay, to, you know, where we can just basically go around saying, you know, all men are awful, but at the same time, there's no difference between men and women, but men are awful, and cis white men, oh my god, they're terrorists, and... It, 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 it's just a shame. It's just really, really, really a shame. And so, for example, if you want to wear two pins and look like an asshole, I mean, go ahead. But ultimately, uh, what, what I'm going to have a problem with is you turning around and using a term like mansplaining, which is sexist. And anyone who doesn't think it's sexist doesn't understand the, the meaning of sexism. Essentially, you know, you, you, can't, you can't use the word bitch anymore, apparently. So, some people say that if you say the word bitch, that in, inherently, regardless of context, that is now, uh, that, that's misogynist. Oh, gay men are screwed. <laughs> Yeah, right? <laughs> but, but, but if you say mansplaining, because there's one dude being a misogynistic asshole, and so you're referring to all men, then you're fine. Because men have privilege and women have the right to say And I was having a discussion, actually a very civilized discussion, believe it or not, but I was having this discussion with, with a self proclaimed feminist, and I was saying that, you know, it's, that, that the use of the word mansplaining is, is just completely offensive, and it's, it's offensive towards men, and it's sexist, and we're supposed to be moving past that. And she was like, well, it's just that you've never been mansplained to. But like, no one has. It's not a thing. It doesn't exist. And, and I, I take her back to this example. Um, for example, my mom, who's always been the, the provider, the breadwinner in, in our home, um, she, she told me once about this really, really nasty meeting she had with a male colleague of hers. And that he was, you know, interrupting her and explaining things that she knew about better than him, you know, just because of the job description and everything. And not once, not once in the conversation did she ever allude to the fact that he's a man and she's a woman because she never saw herself as lesser than. And so that's, that, those are kind of like the mixed messages of the Women's Day thing and all this woman's pride where it's like, at the same time that we're superior and hear us roar and we're fantastic and equality, it's also, we hate men and we're inferior. Because if a man can mansplain to you, then you're putting yourself in a lesser position. No one, no one can disrespect you unless they have inherently more power than you. And so that's one of the things that I just, I just can't get behind. I, I'm never going to stand behind sexism. I'm never going to stand behind discrimination. And that some people stand around saying it's okay because you're a man is pretty despicable. Well, we shouldn't even be having this conversation. I mean, we're two you know, men uh, talking about International Women's Day. I mean, our opinion should really count for zero. Oh, yeah. We should actually be locked up and sent to jail, of course. As a, or we should at least be beat up by, by Antifa, I think, by many people's uh, standard. I think that, that that would at least be... We actually got a message today calling us fascists and Nazis, you know, because uh, even though we have, you know, a, a, a Jew in our, in our creative team now, and we've never ever said anything anti-Semitic or anything, you know, just the fact that we're not adhering to the natural order of what leftists have decided is wonderful, then we're obviously awful people. And also we're men, so...
But but of course we're also told that you know gender is a social contract. Yet these leftists they're still happy to have、uh, International Women's Day. Uh, uh, as uh, Justin Trudeau should, uh, uh, would put it, shouldn't it be International People's Day? <laughs> exactly.、Uh, I mean that's exactly it. That's what people are saying. Like first of all, either gender doesn't exist or it exists. Now you could get into the whole messy, complicated thing about two genders or gender dysmorphia or gender identity. That's a whole different chasm. But if you're saying gender is a social construct, then none of the other things matter. So this whole thing about you saying,、uh, you know, me- women are oppressed. Well, I- how can they be oppressed if there's no difference between them? If they're not women, if they're if they're you know some kind of you know liquid gender thing, then they're not oppressed. And it's one of those things that that just makes no sense. And another thing that they haven't realized is that this whole concept of privilege. They don't understand it at its core. At some point, privilege was meant to kind of state the fact that maybe if you're white in the U.S., certain things are going to come a little easier to you. For example, you're going to be able to drive a car, a really nice car, in a T-shirt, and no one's going to pull you over. Versus if you're a black guy, maybe you'll have a, fl- a higher chance. And that was kind of what privilege was alluding to. You know, just some things are easier for some people than others. And it's been distorted into this like. Hateful thing where essentially you were born this color, and so you have this inherent like wonderful privilege that no one, none of us have, and so we basically have the right to level the the field by then bringing you down by being racist towards you by、uh, treating you like your opinion doesn't matter, and it, it, you know it, it kind of flies in the face of everything else, and so、um, and, and the, the same thing goes for 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 the women's、uh, for the women's issue. We can talk honestly about the different. Issues that there are with men and women, and it's true. For example, in sectors like tech, that、uh, yeah, you know, a lot a lot of issues have to do more with、uh, how many women are actually graduating from、um, from tech specific careers because a lot of women aren't interested in it. But the fact of the matter is that there is some sexism there. You know, if you go into into Silicon Valley, you know, there's been tremendous accusations of、uh, of really nefarious things happening to women there. But we can't talk about that anymore because leftists have taken it to the extreme that basically somehow Google, who has never had any of these accusations before in their life, just because more men are engineers there than women, that shows that they're sexist. Not because they've never done a sexist thing. Not because they've ever, you know, touched a woman inappropriately, groped her, had to pay her hush money. No, no, no. They're sexist because there's more representation of men, and that's unscientific. But if anyone goes in the face of that, then we're sexist. So it's it's one of those discussions you can't have. I, I doubt that gender equality is going to mean that we're going to equally、uh, celebrate International Men's Day, which is on the the nineteenth of November. Yeah.、Uh, well, that that's oppressive, apparently, for some people. We saw this.、Uh, This art, this video on Tucker Carlson. Obviously, some of the facts in that video were incorrect, but essentially,、uh, there was this. This in the Tucker Carlson video, it says that、uh, this university wanted to ban the word "man," right? That's not true. Obviously, that was a blatant mischaracterization.、Uh, many, many people were alluded to this, but essentially, there was this whole thing about basically now saying、uh, that you have to kind of try to destroy anything that makes reference to a man's speci- male-specific.、Uh, um, How do you say career or something? And so, for example, you can't say mailman. You have to say male person or congressman. It has to be、uh, legislator or you know congressperson or something like that. And it's still kind of ridiculous. But the fact of the matter is that this whole thing of you know we're, we're the same. We just want to be equal. And then you know turning around and saying we also want to get rid of the male individual and you know the inherent like the inherent fact that you're a man, like the fact that you have a penis, even if you're not showing it to me or using it aggressively against me, is inherently to me a, a, an act of suppression. And so I'm going to have to go ahead and disband this because I'm woke, and it's it's awful. So like for example, that's one of the things that I said like. If 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 women want to get together, if homosexuals want to get together, if black people want to get together, anyone who wants to get together and celebrate what they believe is is prideful for them, they should be able to. But it's not that way, is it? The the fact of the matter is that it, when when guys took to Twitter and and started you know、uh, tweeting out you know International Straight Pride Day, it kind of as a joke, but they were like, yeah, you know, it's funny. There was this outcry of you know, oh my God, this is so heteronormative and this is so homophobic and. Like, why can't someone be proud to be straight? If a person can be proud to be gay, they should be able to be proud to be straight. And the idea here is that because male straight males have privilege, then then that's why they can't be proud of it. But then you're saying that only if you're a minority class, only if you're like somehow inherently below anyone else, can you can you、uh, can you celebrate this? Then you're putting yourself in a lesser position, and that doesn't seem like pride to me. That seems like you're being some kind of martyr, and you're flying in the face of treating yourself as an equal. So either we can all celebrate that we're proud of everything, unless unless you're you know celebrating you know.、Uh, You know the, the fact that you're Nazis, in which case I might have some、uh, moral quandaries with that. But if you if you want to have a you know pride about being straight, being white, being brown, being Latino, being anything,、uh, more power to you. 
Uh, I'm sure uh, what happened on International Women's Day will, will probably happen on the, the next uh, Diversity and Minority Day. But uh, thank you, uh, Emilio, uh, for discussing the week's events with me. And also uh, thanks to uh, Steele as well for uh, jumping on as well. Uh, like I said, this is a, this is a new uh, format we're experimenting with. So uh, it, it's good to probably get us all, to get all together in the, in the one space. Yeah, I think so too, and it's, it's always a pleasure to talk to you too. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Hope you are enjoying our new three-way podcasts. They are a bit more difficult to manage, but we certainly hear from a more wider array of perspectives. We mentioned in the show our petition calling on the Australian government to accept white South African refugees. Please add your name to it. It can be found at change.org slash p slash Australian government accept white South African refugees to Australia. Please join us for our next live stream, which will be on Saturday the 17th of March for the South Australian state election and Batman by-election, which will be streamed to our Facebook page. It will begin at 6pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time when the polls close in Batman, so please join us for another night of election result analysis. As we transition to do more live events, we're conducting a series of regular live stream tests on you in our growing Facebook group, which can be found at facebook.com slash groups slash The Unshackled. Also, don't forget, if you want to take The Unshackled to the next level and score some awesome rewards, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash The Unshackled. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.